द वर्ड लोनलीनेस और लोनली इज एक्चुअली अ मिसनोमर द वन हु कॉल्स हिमसेल्फ लोनली इज एक्चुअली नेवर लोनली इफ लोनली मीन्स नॉट बींग विथ एनी बडी नॉट हैविंग एनी बडी टू अकम्पनी यू देन द वन हु इज लोनली इज एक्चुअली नेवर विदाउट कंपनी ही और शी ऑलवेज हैज कंपनी यस एंड हुज कंपनी डज दिस पर्सन हैव दिस पर्सन ऑलवेज हैज हिज ओन कंपनी this will make it easier for us to understand traditionally generally it has been said that the lonely person is the one who is needing somebody else's company right you look at it a little differently you go a little deeper into it the lonely person is not just needing somebody's company in fact it is possible that at times he may even think that he does not need anybody's company he may think that he is not in need of somebody's company because he already is in the company of his own thought hmm the fellow is thinking that he does not need anyone and why does he not need anyone because right now he has his thoughts to accompany him so the lonely person is one who is always with himself do you understand this the lonely person is one who can never leave himself the lonely person is one who is always talking to himself always looking at himself Are you getting it? He is always acutely binded to his consciousness. Now we will understand this. What does that mean? The feeling of i and the feeling of other both exist only in the consciousness right the consciousness consists of two which are these two i and the world whenever you are thinking of the i you have to you compulsorily have to simultaneously factor in the world there is no way you can think of yourself without thinking of the world that is the way of consciousness the i and the world are always 
together. So the lonely person is always attached to his consciousness and in his consciousness exists a figure of himself. This figure is a limited figure. This figure needs protection. This figure lives in fear. Fear of what? Fear of the world that he is parallelly thinking of. So, look at what is going on there. He is not lonely at all. There is much to give him company. There is his own figure and then there is the image of the world. So much is there. That is the lonely person's mind. There is a lot there. That is why I began by saying that the word loneliness may mislead. The lonely person is actually quite full. He has so much in him and going through him. And at the center of this crowd that always occupies his mind sits his own figure. Can you see the mind of the lonely person? It is not at all an empty mind. The entire world is there. The entire world is there and at the center of that world, who sits? He himself sits. So, he is sitting and the entire world is there. That is the mind of the lonely person. Now, this world may sometimes appear friendly to him appear, so he thinks. This world may sometimes appear unfriendly to him, appears, so he thinks. But whether the world appears friendly or not so friendly, the one at the center is always limited and hence afraid. When the world appears friendly, he cannot trust it. He knows he is not really deserving of the friendliness. He knows the world too cannot really be trusted. Things come and go. And when the world is unfriendly towards him, then obviously he has reason for despair. Hmm? But to him, the crowd around him is the only reality. That is the lonely man. He sits at the center and around him is a crowd. Can you look at his eyes with desperation, with hope, with hunger? He is looking at the world. I may get this, I may get that. Who may hurt me? Who can become me? Who is going to be the next one to attack me? Who will be the one to comfort me? He is always looking at the world, right? The lonely person is always thinking. The lonely person is always busy with himself. The lonely person just cannot get rid 
of his own personal concerns. That is loneliness. It is far from an empty dinner table. It is a restaurant choked to capacity. and serving distasteful dishes. Let not the world make you visualize a barren desert. Loneliness is not at all a barren desert. Loneliness is a teeming crowd. Hmm? People, 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 everywhere the world, the world, the world, everywhere. A world that is unknown, a world that really can never be fully known. Nevertheless, a world that is the only hope of the lonely person. Are you getting it? Hmm? The lonely person is always walking with his own shadow. And he has so much attraction and attachment to his shadow that he is always looking only at the darkness which he calls his shadow which he calls his friend and to which he is physically attached. Just as your shadow is physically attached to you. He is so engrossed looking at the darkness that he will not turn back to look at the source of light. When you are busy looking at your shadow, surely you have turned your back to the sun. Have you not? That is the state of the lonely person. He is always with himself. And what is he doing with himself? Thinking of his own welfare. What will happen to me? There is me, there is the world. What will the world make of me? What can I get from the world? And how do I save myself from the world? It's a strange relationship that one has with the world. Hmm? Like in a game of Kabaddi. There is me, there is the other. I have to necessarily engage with the other. If I go to the side of the other to engage with him, I may win some exploits. Or I may get caught there and lose everything that I have. That is the relationship of the lonely person with the world. He is always thinking of himself afraid, insecure. And always thinking of himself in relation to the world. He is very concerned about his self-interest. So do not be misled, please. Just because you may be social, just because you may have people around you, with you, most of the time,
do not call yourself not lonely to be lonely is to be surrounded surrounded not necessarily on the outside but surely within are you worried about yourself is your self interest paramount to you do the thoughts of future keep chasing you do memories keep haunting you you are lonely you are very very lonely do you want to hold on to your relationships do you count your numbers you are lonely who then is alone the fellow who is alone is the one who is not with himself just as the lonely fellow is always with himself the fellow who is alone is rarely with himself because he is not with himself he becomes available he becomes available available to be with that which is you can compare <coughs> the lonely fellow to a man who is driving through a beautiful terrain lovely terrain in a car but his windshield is a mirror the windows of the cars are all mirrors in front of him is the windshield which is a mirror behind him there is another glass which is again a and he is driving through a beautiful terrain he is always with people who are those people himself he is very occupied with himself and that is why he is never available to watch the beautiful he is not available at all it's like you are sitting at a coffee table with two chairs there is a center table there is a chair and there is another one opposite to it on one chair are you seated and on the other chair again you are seated and you are busy conversating to whom to yourself you are always talking to yourself and there is a huge world a huge reality around you but you cannot look at it because you are always talking to yourself. 
that is the state of the and I said that the one who is alone becomes available. Now you know what availability means. What is availability? What is availability? So now you know what enjoyment means. Enjoyment does not mean entertainment. It only means availability. If you can be present to what is, that is enjoyment. That does not mean you will have a special feeling inside of you. It is a simple presence. Are you getting it? The fellow who is alone, is with everything and everybody except himself. And the fellow who is lonely, is with nobody except himself. Are you getting it? The world that the lonely fellow lives in is very different from the world that the alone fellow lives in. The lonely fellow's world is his own construction. It is a dualistic world. It is a world that exists centrally in his own consciousness. It is a world that is the dualistic opposite of his own self-image. He does not really live in the world. He lives in his own mind. He lives here. Just as he has an image of himself that always needs protection, correspondingly, he also has an image of the world. His self-image and his image of the world coexist. Right? And both are his own fiction. The world of the Second fellow, the one who is not lonely, is different. In this world, there is the world without himself. Understand this, please. You may look at a car. You do not look at a car just as a car. You look at the car in relation to yourself. How big is it compared to my car? When can I have that car? The driver of that car zoomed past me. Did he mean insult to me? The color of this car is similar to the color of my first bike. That is how we look at cars. I have to overtake this car. What is common between all these statements? There is the car with reference to me. Because I am always busy with myself, hence I cannot look at everything except in relation to me. That is how the lonely person's world exists. It is a dualistic world. He looks at the world in relation to himself. That is the world of the lonely person because his is a self-centered world. He looks at a car with respect to I. He looks at anything with respect to Are you kidding me? The world of the fellow who is not lonely and who is depicted by the word alone is fundamentally different. In that world, there is just the car, the car as it is, not the car with respect to the person, the car just as it is. Nothing added to it, nothing is abstracted from it. Just the fact. There is nobody within this person 
who needs to borrow his identity from the car. There is nobody here who is so hungry that he would look at a car and pounce upon it in some way or the other. He is alright. He does not need the support of the car. He is not afraid. So he does not need to reject or disparage the car. So he looks at just the world. Hence, this is not dualistic perception. Perception is dualistic only when the observer becomes a function of the things he observes. Do you understand this? If you observe something and that which you are observing changes you, then your observation is dualistic. You look at something exciting and you become excited, then your perception is dualistic and you are lonely. Because now you know that your self depends on the world. You look at something and that which you look, look at changes your state, then you are lonely. So, a strange thing happens in the case of this fellow who is called alone. The world keeps changing its shapes, forms, keeps getting modified, keeps flowing. But this fellow does not quite flow with the world. Because he does not flow with the world, so he is free to understand the world as it is. In understanding the world as it is, he becomes free of the fear of the world. And when he is free of the fear of the world, he becomes free to plunge into the world and flow with the world. But that looks so illogical. We began with saying that he does not flow with the world. And we are ending by saying that he indeed does. You must get the difference between flowing and flowing. Hmm? He is not carried away by the world. He is not spoiled by the world. Remaining himself in his own utter inner security and permanence, he is free to give himself to the world. I know it and it cannot harm me. So I flow. Whereas the lonely person is compulsorily driven. And even as he is being driven, he is being changed all the time by the driver. When the fellow who is alone is with the world, he is not being changed by the one he is with. Are you getting it? He might be with any color, any part, any mood of the world. Something inside him remains free of all moods. He therefore becomes available. 
to the lonely fellow the world as we said is both a danger and an opportunity hence he cannot become available he is necessarily attracted to some part and afraid of the remaining part to which part is he attracted the part that he takes as an opportunity from where does he escape the part that he takes as a threat is that not our story there is this world sprawling outside of us somewhere in this world lies the opportunity to make good of myself and at other places in this world lie mortal dangers i better avoid them so how can this fellow be then available he is not available to either part obviously he is not available to the part that threatens but equally he is also not available to the part that attracts his love is bogus he may say that i desperately want to go to this part of the world where my sweetheart lives but he is not going anywhere because he is always with only one thing his own shadow even his sweetheart is a part of his own projection his own shadow he does not <coughs> love anyone because he is always only with himself the one who is self centered cannot love he cannot love because to love there must be somebody to love this fellow only has his own imaginations that is the most he can love even the one he is attracted to even the parts that he takes as an opportunity are just his own imaginations even when he is with so called friends he is talking not to the friends but to his projections of who they are fighting enemies he is fighting phantoms and loving friends he is loving dreams all his love is dream stuff and that is why his love so frequently gets hurt his dreams are so vulnerable they so easily get shattered he is never available neither to attraction nor to repulsion even while making love he is merely ideating his body is active so is his mind he thinks that he has enmities and he thinks that he has friends and lovers he actually has nobody so poor is he that he does not even have enemies and that is true you are really quarreling hard with someone in a room and suddenly the room catches fire it's a sudden and big fire you will forget all your enmity you will cry out to the only available person in the room your enemy and say please save me the two of you will suddenly become cooperative 
all the enmity will be gone. We do not even have solid enmity. Even our enmity, enmity is opportunistic, occasional. The occasion changes, enemies quickly become friends. The occasion changes, friends quickly become enemies. Husband and wife are breaking each other's head and a third person comes in. And the two get united and turn upon this third person. Have you not seen that? In between the two of us there can be quarrel, but when it comes to an outsider, we are a united front. Our hell is our domestic matter. Conversely, all our domestic matters are hell. Only I deserve to crack open the skull of my husband. No outsider will be allowed that privilege. Only I deserve to rape my wife. No outsider will be allowed that. Enemies quickly become friends. <coughs> friends turn enemies. All are dream stuff. Passing, passing, passing. Nothing has permanence. Nothing has depth. Do you get it? There was this movie, the man was wailing over the dead body of his son. Hmm? And he appeared inconsolable. And then a messenger from the government comes, quietly expresses his condolences and whispers into the ears of the wailing man. the exact compensation amount that the government has sent on the death of his son. Just for a second, just for a brief passing second, The man changes his expression The inconsolable father In that brief passing second Upon hearing the news Of the large figure that the government has offered as compensation for his son's death. 
is made to think of something beyond his grief. The second is brief, it passes. The man again resumes his wails. But that one second is sufficient, very sufficient. The sun is gone. The grief appears to be deep. But even that deep grief has been assuaged, even if for a brief second, by the mighty figure that he is receiving as compensation for the son's death. What if the figure was ten times larger? How long would have been the old man's pause? What if the figure was hundred times larger? What if the figure was a million times larger? Nothing is deep enough, nothing is so deep that something else cannot fill it. Your grief for your son might be deep, but it is not interminably deep. Yes, ordinary money will not fill that depth. But a lot of money would. And the consequence of that is that if the grief of death can be forgotten, even if for a little while, by the dazzling presence of money, then sufficient Bedazzlement can even cause a father to not only not grieve over his dead son, but even to actively kill his living son. And that is why you have sons killing fathers and fathers killing daughters. Because nothing is deep enough. Because the lonely one is always living for himself because everything is within the purview of calculations. The sun has gone. Yes, when we console the griefing family, we tell them that yours is an irreparable damage. Don't we say that? It is an irreparable damage, but it is not actually irreparable. Nothing is deep enough. All damages are with respect to oneself. One is at the center of his world, his lonely world. And because one is limited, hence all the damages to oneself are also limited. And because one is limited, hence all his pleasures and even his love are also limited. Hence, everything can be purchased and sold off. Hence, there is a price tag on everything. Every price tag is a number and anything that is limited can be captured in a number. So, everything is on sale. It is just that you need to quote the right number. You can buy anything. The man will sell anything. You only need to bid high enough. 
there is nothing absolute there and hence there is nothing absolutely out of bounds there. There is nothing absolutely unthinkable there. Everything can be thought of. And hence everything can be put into action. That leads us to the world absolute and unthinkable. In the world of the man who is alone, there are absolutes. There is stuff that carries no price tag because it is not stuff at all. And there is stuff which is unthinkable because only stuff can be thought of and this stuff is special stuff that cannot be thought of. If you are somebody who thinks of everything, then kindly wake up because whatever you think of can always be put up for sale Whatever you think of is not yours, it will be lost. Either you will actively sell it off or time will forcibly take it away. Only that you cannot lose which you have anyway never thought of as yourself or yours. It is strange. That which you have never thought of as yours is the only thing that really belongs to you. And that which you think of as yours is not even yours in your own intention or it is yours only till the time you decide that you want to now do away with it. Whatever you know of as yours is yours only as an item put up for sale in your shop. A shopkeeper has many things in his shop and he rightfully calls all of those things as his own. And they are his own, are they not? But everything that belongs to a shopkeeper is also up for sale. So it belongs to him and it belongs to him, therefore he wants to sell it off for something else. He is always looking for profits. He is never okay with himself. He wants more. He has stuff, but he does not love stuff. Ever seen a shopkeeper who is really in love with his goods? If he were really in love with his goods, would he sell them off? We too have stuff in our lives. We have ideas, principles, friends, people, families. All of them are like items kept in our shops. The shops might be beautiful. The shopkeeper might be taking care of the items in his shop. There might appear a really friendly, neat, amiable relationship between the shopkeeper and his wares. But the fact is that nothing is absolutely unsellable because there is no absolute. Everything is just relative. Everything comes to an end. That is the world of the lonely person. Everything there is conditional. He will never say, I will never do this. Such a thing can never happen. He can do anything. It is just a matter of the depth of contingency. It is just a matter of the bid. Anybody can be betrayed, anything can be deceived, anything can be sold off. 
he really can never commit himself to anything or anybody. That is why he lacks devotion. So now, there are three things that are missing in the life of the lonely person and are present with the fellow who is alone. The absolute, the unthinkable and devotion. The fellow who is lonely just cannot be devoted. He can admire, but he cannot be devoted. Because to be devoted is to give up the right to withdraw your devotion. If you still have preserved your right to withdraw your devotion, then your devotion is not complete because you have not devoted the right. Getting it? Everything is revocable. Everything is conditional. The fellow trusts nothing but himself. And that is obvious because in his world there is nobody but himself. So who else can he trust? He will listen to a Buddha then analyze him and then if his own analysis says believe, he would believe. Whom does he trust? The Buddha or himself? Not only does he trust himself, he trusts himself over the Buddha. Ostensibly, he may go to read books, to listen to teachers. But even when he is reading books, he accepts those parts that his own self approves of. Even when he listens to teachers, he decides when to go, what to listen to, what to make of it and whether to accept or not. Who is he listening to? Himself. Because in his world there is only him and his shadow. Nobody else. Hmm? Are you getting it? What does that leave you with? Yourself? Had there been an absolute, there would have been an absolute effect on everybody, right? But do you see that the effect of this session on you is relative to who you are? Had there been an absolute, then the effect too would have been absolute, not relative, not differentiated, not different. But the effect is so different. Because you are not listening to me, you are listening to? And when you are listening to yourself, you may find yourself so boring that you doze off. Yes? Laughing at your own jokes. Hmm?
the books in front of you are different books, your faces are different, your clothes are different, your names are different, personalities are different. And if I ask you, what have I said, your versions will be different. Where is the absolute? The lonely man takes pride in confidently saying the absolute does not exist. In fact, to him the absolute is merely dogma. To him the absolute is merely an ism, fundamentalism. He will say everything is relative. And yes, if you are living with your shadow, if you are living in the ego, then everything is absolutely relative. Relative to what? Relative to your own ego. There can be no absolute then. Your ego is the center and related, relative to your ego exists the world. The world exists relative to your ego. That is why this lonely man takes great pride in his opinions. Because if absolutes do not exist, then the only thing of value is your opinion. And if absolute does exist, then your opinion is of no value. This lonely man would even call himself a liberal who celebrates diversities of opinions. Obviously, if you want your own opinion to be respected and accepted, then as a reciprocal measure, you have to at least show that you are accepting and respecting the opinions of others. In giving space to the other's ego, even if temporarily, you manage to secure a place for your own ego. You say you be with your opinion and let me stay in the comforts of my own. This fellow will not meditate, he will debate. Meditations do not clash with each other. Debaters clash with each other. This fellow has opinions. To prove your opinion over the other, you have to debate. All debate is with respect to the other. And all meditation has no other in it. In meditation, you do not need to prove anything. You just know. And what you know is not always something that can be proved. Are you kidding? The topic of this series is God and guilt. Have we come, up, come upon God already? It is very necessary for me to not use the word God or at least not use it frequently. It is a very heavily loaded word. It conjures up just too many images. But have we come upon the word God already? Have we? Have we? Yes. Which one? 
the absolute. So the lonely person is the one who has no God. The lonely person only has things relative, relative to his own self. He has no absolute. God is absolute. God is the only absolute. The lonely one is the one who has no God. So if you have no God in your life, you will be necessarily lonely. We would be going through four sessions in this series. The first session is titled Incompleteness. Now you know what is incompleteness? What is incompleteness? Have we come upon the word incompleteness? Which word is that? Loneliness. Now you see what is the relation between God and incompleteness? What is the relation? The only complete is God. The only complete is the absolute, obviously. Absolute is a synonym for completeness. No God, no completeness, just a blind search from door to door. If you are someone who has been begging from man to man, from woman to woman, from relationship to relationship, check! There is no God in your life. Check and check again. There is no God in your life. That is why you are a beggar. I may say God makes you complete, but even that would be a frivolous statement. God is the only complete. To live without God is to not live, at, not live at all. And the fellow who is lonely is actually not living at all. We said that his being is a function of his observation. So he becomes what he sees. Now where is he then? For you to be something, there must be something unchangeable within you. And that unchangeable is called absolute. Now if you are changing as per the situations, conditions, observations, climate, then are you? Do you exist? You don't exist because there is nothing absolutely unchangeable within. Only God exists and if there is no God in your life, do you exist? Do you exist? And if you don't exist, you are very, very afraid. You do not exist, you are very, very afraid. Because if you do not exist, then fear exists and it's a strange situation. Fear exists and you do not exist, then to whom is the fear? Mm -hmm. It's a stupid contradiction. Your thoughts, your actions, your being is proof that you do not exist. But still, to somebody is, there is this thought. There is somebody who is in touch with immortality and does not want to keep vanishing second after second. And that is why he is befuddled. That is why he does not know what to make of life. You are living against yourself. You are believing that you do not exist. You are thinking that you are dead. You are shouting that you cannot speak.
you are reading a book and the book is convincing you that you do not have eyes to read strange paradox do not call it strange because that is the paradox in which we anyway live our lives what is a paradox fundamentally a contradiction don't you see what kind of contradictory life we live look at your face right now Hmm? A small mirror is the best book one can carry in his pocket. Look at your face, just your face. Look at your face as it is while sitting in front of me. And then look at your face as it is when you are at your workplace or at your home or with your friends or family. look at your words and thoughts how they keep changing from situation to situation look even at your intentions your honest intentions not the intentions that you profess at one point you have one intention then you reach some other place and your intentions change this is the contradiction of a lonely life because there is no absolute there hence everything is prone to change there is that moment in which you really feel that you belong to somebody you are not lying and you say i love you and i'll be with you for this whole life and for seven more lives and in that moment you are as honest as you can be but just only as honest as you can be because there is no absolute in your life so you cannot be absolutely honest two days later or two months later or two years later or two decades later you are cursing that moment when you offered your commitment you are very honestly cursing that moment you are just as honest in this moment as you were when you were committing yourself to the other person you are not to be blamed you are as honest as you can, as you can be but your honesty cannot stand the test of time because it is not <sighs> no god <coughs> nothing permanent no god just time and change no god just the slavery of circumstances today he appears handsome and she appears beautiful tomorrow your honest assessment of each other changes hmm now we have said two things 
we have said the fellow who is alone is the one who has the absolute God. We had also said that the fellow who is alone lives only with himself. Now you will know why the Upanishads had to say that really, now come on, really, yes, you are God. The fellow who is alone lives with God. And we also said that the fellow who is alone lives only with himself, not his image of himself. The fellow who is lonely lives with his shadow, his image of himself. Equally we said that the fellow who is alone does not live with anybody. Now what does that mean? Connect the three statements. That means that God is a nobody. The alone has the absolute and the fellow who is alone has nobody. Hence the absolute is a nobody. Now you have the Buddha talking. The absolute is a fast nothingness. When you are comfortable living in nothingness, then you are alone. When you are not comfortable living in nothingness, then you start living with mirrors. You start talking to your own shadows and images. Are you getting it? Even when there is nobody around you, have you noticed? You are busy. Busy with yourself. That is called loneliness. The fellow who is alone has nobody to talk to. Conversely, he has got to talk to. When you are talking to nobody, in that silence, there is you and God. And if the silence is absolute, then even the word and just drops. You and God and the and is gone, absolutely gone. So, you are God. Are you getting it? Hmm? Whenever you need something to survive, whenever you need somebody to depend on, You are taking your shadow too seriously. Hmm? We will go back to the basics before we take up the questions. The lonely fellow is the one who is always with somebody. And that somebody he is with is always his own image. So the lonely fellow is always surrounded, surrounded by himself. Even if he appears surrounded by others, those others are all in relation to himself. Correct? So the lonely fellow will actually never appear lonely. He will always appear surrounded. He will always appear. In fact, he will not bear, tolerate to remain lonely. It is his inner obligation towards himself to remain surrounded. You leave him not surrounded and he will start feeling suffocated. 
he cannot do without his mobile phone that is the sign of a lonely person always surrounded and we repeat that the thing that surrounds him appears to be the world but it is actually just image of himself right okay and the fellow who is alone is the one who is just with absolute. the absolute he needs no images he is not with himself correct himself can be the most sacred word and the most painful word at once the word you the word i the word himself the word self can point either to you as you really are or to your shadow when they point to you as you really are they are called the truth you are then the truth i am then the truth hmm when the word i points to us as we really are then i is the atma and when the word i starts referring to my self image or to my shadow or to my ego then it is the dirtiest word then it is not atma then it is ahanta hmm? the word i refers to both the word i can be used for both atma and ahanta in the case of the lonely person i refers to ahanta in the case of the fellow who lives alone i refers to atma clear jyoti ji has asked acharya ji can you please explain what osho means when he says you help the other to be alone to be so full out of his or her own being that you will not be a need this is with reference to a relationship there is a relationship a relationship apparently involves two hmm and if the two are lonely what are they doing in that relationship just fulfilling their own self interest because the lonely person has nothing but himself in his world the world exists for his sake so that he might be fulfilled for the lonely person who is paramount himself his needs and his needs are great why are his needs great because he is missing the absolute so his need is the absolute and if your need is absolute nothing can fulfill your need the absolute is infinite if you are missing a little then a little can fulfill you if you are missing a little then a little can fulfill you but what if you are missing the absolute now what will fulfill you what hope is there too bad two lonely fellows in a relationship both are missing the both are really missing the both are really missing the absolute 
and both are trying to find in each other the now they keep exploring the absolute hunting for the absolute in the other do they get the absolute had the other fellow had the absolute why would he have had a relationship with you the blind fellow is looking for some light for some vision in the other the other is saying had i had some eyesight why would i have picked you in the first place the fact that i am with you itself proves that i am blind now you are blind and i am blind and both are looking for eye sight in each other both are asking each other for directions both are holding each other's hands in the hope that the other will help them out of of their blindness and misery will that happen hmm but man is a stubborn creature in spite of being humiliated beaten up defeated trampled a thousand times he still gets up and says i can have more the absolute manifests itself as the absolutely shameful in the one who does not have the absolute you see the absolute is absolutely present even in the one who does not have absolute that is the definition he is omnipresent if the absolute is omnipresent he must be present even in fools how is the absolute present in fools there he is present as absolute foolishness is it a joke the absolute has to be present either you have the absolute or you are absolutely in either case the absolute is there in some form or the other when the absolute is not directly there but indirectly it is called maya even maya is presence of the absolute so the two are still sticking to each other in spite of being disappointed a thousand times in fact the more they get disappointed from each other the more they latch on to each other osho is saying there is only one way to redeem this relationship please help the other it is significant he could have said help yourself first he is saying help the other so that you do not remain a need for him till the time the other fellow remains what he is he will keep using you and exploiting you for his own narrow purposes the only way then to save yourself is to either give up this relationship or to help the other not remain what he or she is giving up the relationship is both inhuman and impractical it is inhuman because two blind men or one man and one woman started it off together it might be their ignorance it might be their blindness but they did set off together 
now that you have set off together and you by virtue of grace happen to gain eyesight it is not becoming of you it does not quite befit you to just abandon the other person midway the two of you started together it is just a grace and grace in some sense is just an accident that you happen to walk faster now would you jettison your partner it is not the way of compassion also it is impractical i say because man lives in relationships you can give up on this relationship you will get into some other relationship there again the same story will repeat how many people would you leave and how many people would you get left by because the two of you might start together at some point but after that point your tracks will not necessarily remain parallel and aligned they are bound to get a little disparate so rather than becoming a wanderer in relationships firstly correct the one relationship where you are how do you correct it you correct it by helping the other out ordinarily people think that if their partner is dependent on them then it is some kind of a sign of love even if a warped sign it is not it is no indicator of love in your relationship if you are the other person's need then you are just being exploited and if you continue to remain the other person's need then rest assured you too are using the other person for your own needs otherwise you couldn't have tolerated him to be free of the other help the other be free of you it is inhuman to run away in the name of your freedom personal freedom is just part of loneliness because everything personal exists only for the lonely man for the lonely man there is only his person and personal interests and personal world
when it comes to personal interests we talk of them as lowly if someone wants to have personal money we say it is lowly we denounce it but what if someone wants to have personal freedom or personal enlightenment is that not equally lowly why should that not be denounced someone wants to have money just for himself we say that is base and mean don't we oh you are collecting it for yourself and not sharing it with others you are so selfish don't we say that but what about those who seek freedom and enlightenment only for themselves are they not equally mean and selfish please are they not hmm i am working for my enlightenment the other fellow says i am working for my progress and promotion and prestige are they too radically different huh? don't ask for your personal freedom help others around you be free you will never be personally liberated never it is impossible individual enlightenment is a great myth either all get it together or nobody gets it we all are on the same boat either we all cross or we all sink together are you getting it to help yourself help the other i repeat to help yourself help the other this is not merely altruism you are not being charitable this is the holiest form of selfishness help the other cross over on your back when the other reaches the other shore you find that you too have reached the other shore also without having the other on your back you will find that you cannot swim this is the nature of the world river the world river is a flow of relationships nobody cuts through it alone take everybody with you as many as you can the more you take along with you the more strength you get to take more and more with you and do not take this as an exaggeration i am saying one day you may find that you are carrying the entire universe with you it is not a matter of just the relationship between two people father and son or husband and wife no not at all when the author is saying help the other the other is not merely a person it may be a person to begin with but it never remains a person to end with are you getting it hmm people have talked of the one who cannot be talked of in various ways they have talked of him as a lover they have talked of him 
as a creator, a destroyer. But the most charming description of him is him as a parent, as a father or as a mother. And that is why even amongst saints, you find most references to him as that of father or mother. Yes, some people have called him lover also. Some have called him destroyer also. Some have given him other colorful names, beautiful names. But the most prevalent name is father or mother. There is a reason. You look at what he is doing. You would find that among other things, mostly he is engaged in parenting. He is engaged in having things complete their cycles. Grow up, grow up, grow up, grow up, grow up, grow up, grow up. Even death is the next step in growing up. Grow up, grow up, grow up, grow up, grow up, grow up, die. Grow up, grow up, grow up, die. So even if you call him a destroyer, he is still a parent. He is helping you grow by dying. There is great joy in parenting. There is great joy in helping the other grow and seeing the other grow. Be a parent even to your lover. Be a parent even to your husband, even to your wife. If you are a man, be a father to your wife. If you are a wife, be a mother to your husband. That is godly. Are you getting it? Be a father to your friend. Be a mother to your pet. And obviously, that is far beyond physical procreation. Obviously, that is far beyond social institutions of marriage, etc. You are a parent irrespective of who the other is. Your very touch is a touch of life. Your very touch is a healing touch. You touch someone and he grows. You know what is growth? Growth is expression. You know what is expressed? The truth is expressed. That is what is called being a parent. You touch the other one and his heart comes to be expressed. That is godly. That is the only way anybody ever grows. That is the only way anybody ever gains maturity. By parental touch, by the touch of God, by the touch of absolute. Touch the other one and help him gain maturity. That is the joy of living. That is in some sense the only way of living. And the more we talk of it, the more it appears foolish to escape away to some corner of the city or to a village or to a desert or a mountain to any secluded place and hide there. 
Look at the one you are worshipping. You are saying you are going to hide in that cave so that you may worship. The one you are worshipping remains engaged. He is engaged with you, with you, with you, with you, with you. He is always in relationship. God is in a million relationships. Million is such a small number. Hmm? Why must then you abdicate your relationships? Help the other grow. Helping the other grow. is not a matter of pride. You will be skinned alive. The other does not want to change. The other does not want to grow. You try to help the other grow, you will realize that you firstly have to help yourself. So it is a parallel thing. You remaining what you are, your intention will merely remain an intention. You will want to help the other, the other will retort and you will find that you two are reacting and all the help has gone out of the window. You go to the other and say, darling, tonight you will grow. And that night, You have the great dance of destruction. She proves to you that she is already mother goddess. She needs no growth. To live through that dance of destruction, first of all, you will need to grow. That's why I said that it will be a parallel journey. Think it. Hmm? Apparently, it is quite an ego trip to be a parent, to be a helper. It is not. It is actually a destruction of ego to really help the other. You will have to come down from your high palace to the low grounds. The other is not prepared to go up. The other is saying, I am all right where I am. You come down to my place. Now you are a resident of the high skies. The other does not come to the high skies. She stays where she is. So you go there and get beaten up. It has to be a parallel thing. You will have to parallelly grow along with the other person. Now you know what I meant when I said that it's either everybody together or nobody. Because you and the world are one. As you attempt to help the world, you are parallelly helping yourself. Remaining what you are, the world will remain what it is. And just to help you through your night of destruction, may I just Say that the joy of seeing the other grow far surpasses all 
the troubles that you face. Raising a kid is a nightmare. But that nightmare is very, very bearable, indeed joyful, when you really see what you are doing. The fruits are there, the fruits are daily there. And if you do not see them daily, have some patience. The fruits will appear. People talk of the pleasures of ego. The pleasures of ego are nothing compared to the great pleasure of seeing a human being blossom in front of you. That is the greatest of pleasures. That is so great a pleasure that ego cannot handle it. You have not merely modified, you have not merely transformed, you have really given birth, you are now God, you are now Mother God. There is no pleasure bigger than this. Hmm? Great pleasures, absolutely great pleasures are called joy. Yes. So those of you who are addicted to some kind of pleasure or the other, and there are many young people here, those of you who are seekers of pleasure, to them I am saying, this pleasure exceeds any pleasure that you know of. If you are with somebody, then there is pleasure. In being a lover to that person, Have that pleasure, all right, fine. You want to have the pleasure of the other's company, the other's smell, the other's body, the other's voice, the other's looks, have that pleasure. But the pleasure of being a parent to the other, don't miss out on that one. Hmm? Be a father to your girlfriend and don't mind if she minds it. Be a father to your father. Help him be born. Yes? Kishorji is saying that if God is a parent, then we must offer Him respect and regular worship, puja, dhyana, arjana, ityadi. 
he's saying that he often misses out on these things and then he feels guilty. If you are a parent, you know that it is not really superficial respect or rituals or observation of ceremonies that you want from your child. If you are really in love with your child, you do not just want him to offer some customary signs of respect. You want him to really grow. That is what any loving parent wants. His fulfillment is related to the fulfillment of the child. Nothing short of genuine growth of the child would please the parent. Right? That is the only thing that would please the parent. What? Genuine growth of the grower, the child. So if God is a parent, what would genuinely please him? Your puja archana or your if God is a parent, what would please him? Your real growth or the ceremonies that you offer to God? Right, Kishorji? He is not looking for all the foods that you offer him, for all the hymns that you sing to him, for all the fasting and the celebrations in the name of God that we profess. He wants you to be really close to Him, so close that you are Him. That's what pleases Him. So if you miss out on fasting, if you miss out on recitation of prayers, It's okay. Do not miss out on the real thing. If prayers are leading to the real thing, only then prayers are useful. Otherwise, praying and fasting and pilgrimages and rituals are hollow. God wants you to be godly. Nothing more, nothing less. Yes? If you are not godly, then anything else that you do is in vain. Live a godly life. 